Sonia, great job. Uh, good morning, church. How are we doing today? Yeah, oh, that's great. I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking. No, it's good. It's good to be here today. Um, you know, it's just such a, like I say every week, it's such a warm feeling that I get to come and, and be here with you guys on a Sunday morning. And this morning, I've got a really, what I feel like is a, a special message. I kind of want to lay the groundwork for it and let you know that we're talking about forgiveness. Um, we've been doing part of a series called No Offense, but, but this idea of, okay, you need to forgive and forgive yourself and be forgiven by others. And, and this could be a really heavy message. It could be a really confrontational message. But I want to let you know up front that this is going to be more uh, of, of a gentle hug. So I, I feel like this week I've got a soft spot for you and that God's given me a soft spot for this room and the people that are in it. And so as I deliver this to you, as we talk through this, I want you to soften your heart and be able to receive it. Because forgiveness and the need to forgive makes our heart hard. And it can make us a little bit bitter. So I'm saying, okay, let's soften our hearts. And in fact, we're going to start off with some really great news. I've got a verse for us that Paul wrote in Colossians. And he's writing to the, the, the church here in Colossians. And he says this. So this is Paul talking to the church. So here I am. I'm not Paul. But I'm Chris. But I'm talking to you, the church. And he says, for he rescued us. And has drawn us to himself from the dominion of darkness. Now, what, what I take from this, and before we go on to the verse, I just want you to know that Paul's talking to the church. So if you're a Christ follower, then you are part of the church. If this is your first Sunday, if you're not a Christ follower, then I want you to think of this as like the, the preview of what you would get to step into if you decided to follow Jesus. Now, you don't have to. It's not my job to convince you to give your life to Jesus. It's my job to present it to you in a way that's accurate the way Jesus wanted it presented. And I believe that that's attractional. So if, if that's not you, that's okay. But I want you to know this is a preview for what you would get. And so for all of us that say, okay, we are Christ followers, that, that, that is us, Paul is saying that you are rescued and, has drawn to, and were drawn to himself from the dominion of darkness. So what would the dominion of darkness be? Just think about like, um, like hard, hard things. Think about things that would hurt. Think about painful things. Think about uh, a life without Jesus. Think about a lot of maybe depression or things like that. Just this kind of like this darkness, this sin, this stuff that's in your life. And Paul's saying that, hey, no, you're rescued and drawn for that. And in fact, the word, the word rescued, the meaning of the word rescued actually has this meaning of snatched from danger. So if you think about a, a child, any parents in the room, if you see one of your kids run out of the gate and a car coming down the road, you would run up to that child and you would snatch them away from danger. You would rescue them. And that's the word that Paul is using to describe what God and what Jesus has done for us. We've been snatched away. And the other important thing about this is if you don't snatch your child when they run out into the road in front of a car, they will inevitably be you know, hit by that car. It'd be a horrible thing. In the same way that if God didn't reach down and snatch us and rescue us from darkness and from danger, then we are 100% headed for an accident. So here we have, Paul is writing this verse, and we've got this great news that we are rescued. We are snatched away from danger. And now Paul continues in the verse, and he says, in the, in the rest of verse 13, he says, and, and, we can, and, and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Now, this may be hard to kind of understand because the verse is a little bit chopped up, but I want to focus on this word, conveyed. The, the word conveyed that, that Paul is using here, what it means is if you were a people group, okay, maybe a kingdom or a, a, a tribe or an ethnicity or whatever, and you took over and you conquered somebody else, then what you would do is you would convey them into your society. So you would bring them into and they would speak your language. They would adopt your culture. You would immerse them into your society, your culture, your rules, your values. That was a pretty standard thing. They would either kill everybody or they would, they would convey people into their community, into their society and their culture. And so what, what Paul's talking about here is that we are conveyed into the kingdom of the son of his love, which means that, that as a conveyed person, everything we have and everything we are now belongs to him. So here we have this verse that Paul is, is tenderly giving to us. 
And it's all about this, this kingdom of God. And that we have been rescued from darkness, from sin. And we have been conveyed into the kingdom of God. Meaning we, we have been brought in. Now everything that we are belongs to Him. So this is really great news for us. It's really, really great news for us. And if it's not great news for you, it could be great news for you if you decided to accept it and to choose it. Now, there's a quote that I love by a guy named Charles Spurgeon. He um, writes kind of in Old English. He's a really old guy. And he does a lot of, of Bible commentary. And this quote that he says, he's talking about what Paul's talking about here, that we've been rescued and conveyed from the dominion of darkness, which means that Satan has no power over us. And so he puts this so well for, well for us. He says, beloved, that's us. We are tempted by Satan. Yes, temptation still comes. It will always come. But we are not under his power. That's the truth. We have to fight with him, but we are not his slaves. That's the truth. He is not our king. That's the truth. He has no rights over us. That's the truth for us. We do not obey him. That's the truth for us. We will not listen to his temptations. All these things are truths for us because we've been rescued. We've been conveyed to the kingdom of God. And so now after being rescued and after being conveyed, there's one more really important step to that, and that's being integrated. So here we're talking about you as a person, as a Christ follower, whether it's a new Christ follower or an old Christ follower, you entering into the kingdom of God. That's entering into a relationship with God, entering into a faith transaction where you put your faith in God and he pours his grace out on you. That's what this is. And so after you've been rescued and conveyed, the next part is, is integration. We're integrated into the kingdom of God. So how do we do that? Well, fortunately, we don't have to do much to do that because the Holy Spirit does that on our behalf. The Holy Spirit works in our lives. So if you don't know what the Holy Spirit is, think about the Holy Spirit as like God's helper. And the Holy Spirit does for you what you can't do for yourself. In fact, the Holy Spirit even knows how to pray for you. So when you don't even know what to pray, the Holy Spirit actually intercedes for you in the throne room of God. See, the Holy Spirit was sent to us after Jesus ascended into heaven. And Jesus himself said, I've got to go home, but I'm going to give you something even better than me. And it's the helper. It's the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit helps us to integrate into the kingdom of God. It helps us know the values. It helps us know uh, the rules. It helps us know the culture of the kingdom of God. And we know what this is. If anyone has ever done anything wrong and you feel that, that pit in your stomach and you think, man, I really shouldn't do that. This is not right. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't smoke that. I shouldn't drink another. Like maybe that's a lot of that is the Holy Spirit saying, hey, this is not in line with the kingdom of God. Let me steer you away from that. And so we, 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 we have this truth that we get to recognize, that this, this truth for us about the kingdom of God. Now, Paul goes on in the next verse to continue talking about the, the kingdom of God. And it, it's interesting that when Paul starts to address further this idea that we enter into the kingdom of God, one of the first things that he brings up is the idea of forgiveness. So he could have brought up anything else, but instead he brings up forgiveness. And he says this in verse 14. In whom, so he's continuing on, in whom is God. So in, in whom we have redemption. We've been redeemed. We've been rescued. We've been conveyed. We've been integrated. Because of his sacrifice resulting in, so that's the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, we have forgiveness of our sins and the cancellation of sin's penalty. So one of the first things that Paul wants us to understand when it comes to the kingdom of God is the concept of forgiveness, which is what we're talking about today. Now, so far, this has been really great news. I've not told you anything bad. I've not told you anything that should make you feel guilty or make you even feel convicted. I, I, I want you to understand that when it comes to forgiveness and when it comes to God and Him bringing you into His presence, it is a good, happy, wonderful thing. And in fact, the, the word that Paul uses for forgiveness in this verse, it, it means that our sin and our guilt are actually sent away. So if you think about God actually taking, I, when I was, was working on this, I thought about like a river flowing and this river of life flowing to me. 
And as this river of life is flowing into me, God is like standing above the river. And if any trash, if any logs, if any stumps, if anything comes down and tries to clog the river or dirty the river, God is just there sending it away, cleaning it away. And that's what God does with, with our sin. God forgives us. So we have forgiveness of sin. Now, there's two different kinds of forgiveness that we're going to talk about. There's vertical forgiveness, and then there's horizontal forgiveness. So vertical forgiveness would be, I need forgiveness from God, and God is forgiving me. So that's up and down, because everyone knows that God is up. And so up, down, God forgives us, we forgive Him. Now, horizontal forgiveness is when we forgive each other, because we're all sort of, as far as God sees it, we're all kind of on the same playing field. So horizontal is I forgive my brother, he forgives me. I forgive my neighbor, they forgive me. We forgive each other. Vertical is we forgive, or God forgives us, we ask God for forgiveness. So what happens when you take a vertical line and you put a horizontal line on top of it and then you move it up just a hair, then all of a sudden, you know, you have the cross. And so vertical forgiveness and horizontal forgiveness kind of paints for us the picture of the completeness of what Christ did on the cross for us. And so we, we, we have this forgiveness. Now, we're going to talk about a story, and we spoke a little bit about it last week. This idea of forgiveness that we all have access to, it was hard for the disciples to understand this. So let me take you back to Jesus' time. And while Jesus is talking and preaching and telling, you know, the disciples how to live their, their lives and how to be, um, you know, disciples of the kingdom, while Jesus is doing that, things come up about forgiveness. And, and you have to understand that the Jewish law had all kinds of rules as to why people would be cast out, as to why they would be segregated from society, as to why they would have to do all kinds of things that if they, well, if they didn't do certain things, they would be almost like disqualified. They'd be disqualified from the temple. That there was always a price to pay. And see, before Jesus, these rules were put in place. Some of them were put in place. But then the Pharisees added something like 450 rules on top of the Ten Commandments to make sure that they didn't break any of the Ten Commandments. So you got like 450 ways to fail. It's basically what that is. You know, it's like, why even try? You have some people with tryhards that decide to be Pharisees and they try really hard. I think I would just be like, forget it. I am not going to keep all 450 of these things. But so, so, so Jesus is teaching and his disciple, Peter, is maybe struggling with this. And so Peter asks Jesus, he's like, okay, but Jesus, let me get this straight. Let me get this forgiveness thing straight here. And so Peter asks him. He comes to Jesus and he says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? So Peter's basically saying, at what point can I stop forgiving my brother who's done something wrong to me? When does forgiveness run out? When am I allowed to stop forgiving somebody? Okay, if someone does you, if someone cuts you off in traffic, it's easy to forgive them. If someone beats your wife or your husband... That's hard to forgive. If someone does something like a murder, it's like, man, we have to forgive that as well. If someone nails Jesus on the cross because of the sins of the world, you know, is that forgiven? See, what Jesus is trying to get, what Peter's trying to understand is where, where's the line? When can I stop forgiving people? When can I, where's it? Because there has to be one. See, in his mind, in our mind, we just can't fathom that there's no line. And we all have people in our lives where we've forgiven them over and over and over and over again. And then finally, they've done something or they continue to do something. And we just say, okay, you know what? I'm, I'm done. I'm done forgiving this person. I'm not going to do it anymore. A lot of us have a hard time forgiving ourselves. We, we've lied to ourselves so many times. We've hurt ourselves so many times. That finally we say, you know what, I just know I'm going to fail again, so I'm going to stop forgiving myself. I've done it seven times, number eight, done. I'm done forgiving. But Jesus answers. And this is a story a lot of us know. But Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Now Jesus isn't asking Peter to do actual math. He's, he's letting Peter know that, that it's, it's, it's infinite. It, there is no line. 
And so <clears throat> it goes on in the next verse. And I've got therefore highlighted for you because now Jesus has said, these guys are kind of dumb, they're dense, they don't understand this. So let me tell them a story that helps illustrate the point and helps them understand what it is that I'm trying to get across. So here's Jesus telling the story. So Jesus is looking at Peter, looking at the disciples, and he says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. Now, this would be a normal thing. This would be something that everyone would understand. There's a person in authority. They have people that work for them, that manage money or property for them. And at some point in time, it would be normal for that person in authority to say, I want to settle my account. I want you to pay in what, what you owe me. And so to the disciples, norm, this is normal. It's a story they can identify with. And then he goes on to verse 24. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one of them was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. I want you to remember that number. And so then he goes on. But as he was not able to pay... His master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment would be made. So this man owes the guy 10,000 talents. He can't afford to pay that back. So the, the king says, okay, fine, I'm going to sell you. Now what's interesting is that selling a person into slavery or selling a person was usually worth about one talent. So the, the, the king knows that he's not going to get his 10,000 out of this guy. But it's more of like a principal issue. Like, you know what? You can't pay for it, so therefore you forfeit your, your life. So now I'm selling you off. And so after the king makes this announcement to, to the guy, obviously he panics, has a bit of a breakdown. And he says, the, the servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me. As if this guy is just the next day going to come up with 10,000 talents. It's not going to happen. But he's like, please have patience with me and I will pay you all that I owe. Then the master of that servant, he was moved with compassion. And so he released him and he forgave him the debt. So he forgives him of everything. So now the man has zero debt. He's been forgiven. Okay, so we're, we're tracking along with our theme of forgiveness here. This is great. So then this man that's been forgiven, he goes out to one of his servants because there's a hierarchy of servanthood. So he's got people that work for him. And he goes out and he says, but the servant went out, same servant, and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. So that's, that's, that's a lower number than a talent, and I'll explain that to you. And he laid hands on him, so he actually took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. And now this servant, the servant of the servant, he says he falls down on his feet and he begs him and he says, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And he would not... The guy says, I'm not going to have patience with you. Sorry, no forgiveness for you. I have forgiveness, but no forgiveness for you. I don't know if we have any Seinfeld people in the room, but it makes me think about the soup Nazi. No soup for you. I heard I've, some people have seen that. I just Everyone that laughed is old, so. <laughs> Time to lean into it. Just accept it. So he said, he, the guy doesn't have patience, and he, he wouldn't have patience with him. So he went and throws this guy into the prison till he should pay off the debt. Now, word gets out about this, and so in verse 31, So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved, and they came and told their master all that had been done. So that, that, the people around him were like, this, ain't, this is not right. It's not the right thing to do here. And so what happens in verse 32 is then the master, he heard him. He heard what had happened. So he calls the servant in, the guy that had been pardoned, the guy that had been forgiven. And he says, you wicked servant. These are bold words. I forgave you all the debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? So he confronts him with this question. Where was your compassion? Where was your forgiveness? And in verse 34... The master, he gets angry, and he delivered him to the torturers until he should pay. So he went from being sold into slavery, which could have been a, a good deal, a bad deal. Maybe that just meant that he went and worked somewhere else. But generally, slavery at the time would have a roof over your head. There would be food on the table. Um, and now he's gone from that to now he's being tortured until he should pay a debt that he'll never be able to pay back. 
So this is a death sentence. And then in verse 35, we get this sort of bomb. This is the, the, part, the first part of today's message that, that is kind of confrontational to us and to our spirit. And that, that is, is this. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So if we take a look at this story on face value, this is something that we can all wrap our heads around. It's simple. The idea is that God is the king and we are the servant and that God forgives the servant all the debt. And then the servant goes out and doesn't forgive his servant or his fellow brother. So God is the king and he forgives me, forgave Chris of his sins. And then I go out and I get mad at somebody because they've done me wrong and I refuse to forgive them. And then God is saying, hey, there's a consequence to that. There's, there's, there's judgment for that. That's not the way I want you to live your life. That's not what it's like to be in the kingdom of God. But see, I want to take it to a different place. I want to explain this to you in a, in a different way. See, we, we look at this story's face value, but, but Jesus could have used any analogy that he wanted to in this story. He could have used sheep. He could have used land. He could have used food. He could have used anything. But instead, what Jesus chose to use when he was telling this story was currency. So Jesus chooses currency. Remember, you have the talents and you have the denarii. Those are two forms of currency. And so in this story, we have two relationships. And the two relationships, one is between the king and the servant. And he owes 10,000 of these things called talents. The second relationship for us to know about is between the servant and the servant. And he owes 100 denarii. So let me break this down for you. And if you get lost in the numbers, just hang in there um, because it'll all make sense here in the end. But let me do some conversion for you here. So the first relationship that we're going to focus on is between the king and the servant. So this is 10,000 talents. So one denarii equals one day's wage. And one talent equals 6,000 denarii. So the guy, he owes 10,000 talents or 6,000 days worth of work. Like a, 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 of, a, of a worker's pay for a day. So now we put that into the context of numbers. And here, here's some numbers. So we've taken numbers from, um, from 2021. And the best numbers that I could find were, were in dollars. Uh, you know, unfortunately, South Africa's reporting uh, and census data is not super accurate or able to find. So I've done some conversions here. So one denarii is worth $154.64. That would be the equivalent of it. That's a day's wage in, in dollars today. One talent is 6,000 denarii. So therefore, one talent is worth $927,840. So 10,000 talents is worth 9278000 Four, oh wait, I feel like Jacob Zuma now. Uh, uh, nine, two, seven, eight. <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, I, 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 practice, I, I practice these numbers so many times. Nine billion, two hundred and seventy-eight million, four hundred thousand dollars. Thank you, yes. Yes. So in Rand, that's one hundred and sixty-six billion nine hundred and eighteen million four hundred and sixteen thousand Rand. Yes, we got it. This is an astronomically high number. So this man owes ten thousand talents to to the king or to, to his king. What Jesus is trying to show us, this number is not payable back. You can't pay this number back. This is an unreachable, unfathomable number. See, the debt that Jesus is trying to uh, portray is that we carry a debt to our king that we will never be able to pay back. That's why we need a king who's a savior. That's why we need a king who can be compassionate for us. See, the king took compassion when the man begged. And so he forgave, not part of the debt. 
He forgave all of the debt. This is a large amount of money. It's unfathomable how large this amount of money is. And the king just forgave it all. See, Jesus wants people to understand. When, when Jesus told the story and he said he owes 10,000 talents, the whole crowd would have been like, you know, oh my goodness. Because they know how much money that would have been. And so that's, that's one relationship that Jesus is trying to paint the picture of between the king and between us, the servant, is that we are forgiven of a debt that we will never, ever, 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 ever be able to pay back on our own. So now if we look at the second relationship, we look at the man, the servant, who's us, we get pardoned by the king, then we go out and we have someone who owes us a debt, and it's a hundred denarii. So if we do the same math here, we're owed about $15,464 or 278,154.53 rand. That's how much is owed to us. And, and even though we've been pardoned, you know, a billion dollars, we turn around and over 278,000 rand, we, we refuse to forgive that person. We say we, we want it, we claim it back. So what Jesus is telling people is that this is an obtainable number. $15,000, that, that's, that's, that's hard to swallow. That would be a big loss. But, but many of you spent more than this on the car that you drive or, or definitely on the house that you live in. See, see th this is an obtainable number. What, what Jesus is trying to show us here is that, is that your forgiveness, the debt that you owe to each other horizontally, will never be as great as the debt that you owe to Jesus vertically. And if Jesus has forgiven us vertically, then there is no debt horizontally that we cannot forgive. And Jesus is using these numbers to show how ridiculous it is that we would be forgiven for billions, but then turn around and, and refuse to forgive the debt of somebody that owes us. It's, it's still a lot of money. You know, this, this 15 grand, that, that represents hurt, family hurt. That represents somebody lying to you. That represents somebody throwing you under the bus and causing you to lose a job or causing you to lose friends. This represents, this is real. I mean, this is a real sum of money and it, it hurts our pockets. Jesus is saying, yeah, you're going to encounter things that are going to hurt your heart. You're going to encounter people that are going to take advantage of you. People are going to owe you a debt, meaning they're going to do something to you that will hurt you that you will have to then forgive. But we have to renew our perspective on forgiveness. We've got to change this. And this is what, what Jesus is trying to show us by these two currencies. Isn't Jesus a great teacher? See, he uses things that people can identify with and that they know, and it translates even to us today, is that, is that Jesus is like, you need to change your perspective. You need to change the way you look at forgiveness. Forgiveness is so freely given to you doesn't matter what you've done. There's no one in this room that's disqualified from being forgiven by God above. Nobody. And some of you need to accept that. There's, there's someone in this room today, probably many, who just can't wrap their head around the idea that they could be forgiven. Maybe you've just been too mean You've looked at too much pornography. You've drank too much. You've cheated too many times. You've gone out. You've denounced Jesus. You've called Christians uh, names. Whatever it is that you've done, you've just decided, I'm unforgivable. And what Jesus is trying to show through this story is that you are always forgiven. You just have to choose it. And now I want you to change your perspective and instead of focusing on that, that little amount that somebody else has done to you, just wipe that debt clear. See, what Jesus wants us to do is, is this, the, the, the more that you think about the debt that Jesus paid for you, the less that you think about the debts that are owed to you. See, this is the change in our perspective. It's the more that we think about that vertical salvation. You know, if, if I was forgiven you know, billions and billions of, of, of dollars. I mean, it's like, what's, what's, what's a couple thousand? That's nothing. Praise the Lord. I'm at, you know, like just write that off. 
over and done. And see, that's the perspective that Jesus wants us to have. But we have the opposite perspective where we walk around and we can't help but look at and think about the things that other people have done. And we think about, we have those shower conversations, I thought last week, where we argue with the other person in the shower. They're not in the shower with us. We're in the shower by ourselves. That's why we always win those arguments. Because they, they need to know that they did us wrong. They need to know that they don't deserve forgiveness. They need to know that they hurt me. Jesus is saying, why are you focused on that? I gave you life. I gave you life abundantly. I forgave you of the sin that put me on the cross. I did this for you. And see, this is a wonderful gift for us. But it does come with a condition. There's one, there's one condition, and it's, it's a hard one. It's a hard one for some of us. Some of us, we get really good at it. But some of us, it's really hard. And that, that condition is, is outlined for us in, in 1 John and it's this word, confession. Now, this is hard. It's hard to do. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, how many hidden sins are you not confessing? See, we all have that thing in our life. And I'm not going to ask you to do it here out loud. We're not going to do anything um, uh, weird here. I just want you to think. How many sins in your life are just your secret? How many things is it? Is that, no, 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 no. I don't, I'm not. This is. Eh, I'm happy to confess the extra donut that I ate, but to confess this other thing, no, I'm not going there. Absolutely not. I'll take that to the grave with me. See, when we do that, we're missing out because if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. He forgives us of our sins and He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. But in verse ten. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So when we refuse to confess our sins to Jesus, it's like saying we don't need him. Because our sin isn't that bad. When we refuse to confess, it's like, oh, what you did on the cross doesn't matter. What you did on the cross doesn't matter for me. And it's like we make Jesus out to be a liar because Jesus is saying, you're all sinful. You all need to be forgiven. And I will freely forgive you all of everything that you've ever done. Just confess that you're a sinner. Boom, done, forgiven. But there's some of us that say, you know, hey, I, I, I'm not going to confess this. I don't want to confess it. Not to God in private, not to somebody in public. And when we do that, we're, it's kind of like calling, I mean, this is what John wrote here. I consider myself quite confrontational. John's, he's right in our face there. We have to wrestle with this. This isn't something that we get to ignore. We can't just pick the great part out of the verse and leave the rest of it. That's, that's not the way that this works. But see, sin, this is a truth I want you to know. Sin is only a problem if there is no forgiveness. So if sin is only a problem, if there is no forgiveness, then why would we not confess our sin? Because there is unlimited forgiveness. Are we tracking with that? See, there is no sin that cannot be forgiven. There's no situation that you're sitting in, in your chair, that cannot be forgiven. So therefore, we can confess. But there's one thing that stands in the way of that. This is something I struggle with. It's something I know a lot of other people struggle with. And it's the greatest enemy, is pride, is the biggest enemy to our forgiveness. Oh man, pride is like a monster in us. And when we think about pride, we often think about like being macho or hey, look at me, I'm amazing or, or just overplaying ourselves. But, the, but that's not the only definition of pride. You know, other versions of pride are, are I don't need God, I don't need God's forgiveness. Or I don't need to confess or I'm afraid to confess because what if somebody thinks differently of me or I'm afraid to confess this sin I'm afraid to confess my shortcomings to God because what if I can't even hold up my end of the bargain with God and your pride gets tested and your pride becomes the biggest enemy to your forgiveness and see there, there's something in us especially when it comes to relationships with each other especially when it comes to families how many families are broken? How many families in this room have brokenness in them 
because there's a refusal to forgive. And how much of that refusal to forgive is because somebody is prideful? It's, it's a lot. See, pride is, the, is, is such a downfall to mending relationship, to mending family. Today, we have got to let go of this pride. And the reason we've got to let go of it is because pride will rob you of your blessing because it robs you of your forgiveness. See, the forgiveness of our debt is the greatest thing that we've ever been given. It's the greatest gift that we could ever have. And the worst thing that we could ever do is turn that gift down and turn it away. And the worst thing that we could do is to let pride rob us of our blessing because pride robs us of our forgiveness. You know, when you finally build up the courage to confess to somebody a sin or a problem that you have in your life, the freedom that comes from that is just absolutely amazing. It's incredible. It's just this, this release. I want you to imagine whatever is, is that, that sin that's in your life, or, or let me put it to you this way. Think about, let's do this a thought exercise. Think about something in your life that needs forgiveness applied to it. Whether that's you need to be forgiven, or you need to forgive yourself, or whether that's you need to forgive someone else, or that you're hoping someone else forgives you. Think about that. Think about how it's been tearing a rift into your family or into your heart or into relationships. How, how, it, how, how it's created awkwardness there, how it's created separation. Think about that in your marriage, how at one point in time you stood at an altar and you said, I do and I do, and I do until death do us part. And then now you're trying to kill yourself, each other, so that death does do you part. Because there is pride. Neither one of you wants to give anything. Neither one of you wants to admit that you're, that you're right or that you're wrong. There's, there's, I don't want you to lose your blessing. I don't want you to lose the blessing of forgiveness. Think about the man that was forgiven billions and billions of debt. The way that that would feel. That, that's the blessing that we have for you. And so as you think about that situation in your family, as you think about that in your life, and your relationships, I just want to encourage you not to stop. I don't want you to stop here because peace is just on the other side. See, I, I don't want this to end in, in this room and in this moment because th there is peace that will come out of this. When you confess, when you forgive, peace comes out of it. See, it's, it's this beautiful thing. Do you want to carry around the weight that is the debt of, forg of, of unforgiveness? If you think about that much money, the 10,000 talents, even if you think about it in a physical quantity, think about how heavy that was. That's a lot. You could almost put 15 grand in your pockets. You can't put billions and billions in your pockets. So Jesus is like, I'll take all that weight and all that debt off your shoulders. I'll just take all of it. I'll take all of it away. All we have to do is confess. Confess our sins. Confess to God. Confess to each other. Just confess for forgiveness. And then confession does this really magic thing. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And it overshadows anything else. But confession kills pride. And it opens the heart to forgiveness. If someone else is having a hard time forgiving you, one of the best things you can do is go up to them and just, and just confess, Hey man, I'm so sorry I hurt you. Even if it's their fault. Who cares? The end result is that is that you're, you guys are, 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 your relationship is restored. Who cares? You've been forgiven by Jesus. Who cares who's right or wrong? But go up to them and confess, hey man, I'm so sorry that our relationship has gotten to this point. And just watch the walls fall down. Watch the heart soften. Watch, watch people's hearts be prepared for forgiveness. See, don't, don't stop when you leave this room. So my, my hope for you today and we're about to have a chance for you guys to think through this as we sing one more song. My hope for you today, the bottom line is this. I hope that you find peace 
because you've let forgiveness into your life. I hope that you accept the forgiveness from, from Jesus of the, of the greatest debt that you could never repay. But then I hope that you can forgive horizontally. And I hope that through confession and through getting rid of your pride that your relationships are healed. See, I want you to have a better relationship with Jesus, but I also want you to have a better relationship with each other. And the best way to do that is, is if I can help you heal with God's truth. So confession, drop the pride, let forgiveness take root in your heart. So I'm going to pray for us, and, and after I do that, we're going to have, like we do every week, we're going to have some prayer partners down here in the corners. And if you want to come up for prayer, maybe you need prayer for forgiveness. Maybe you don't. Maybe you need prayer for anything. It could be anything in the world. You can come up and get prayer. And if you don't want to come up during the service, that's okay. Our prayer partners, they hang out after the service. You can come up and get prayer then. But prayer matters. And prayer is bringing someone else into it with you. We're not here to solve your problems. We're not going to do magic. It's just we're here with you. We want to be in the trenches with you. And we want to be a part of your lives with you. So we have a prayer team that we've assembled, uh, assembled specifically to do that with you. And then the band is going to lead us in a song. And I just want you to lean into this song. Because when you walk out there and you walk through those doors, life gets busy. And so everything that God is doing in here, as loud as it feels, as much as the heart's beating... It gets a little bit quieter when you go out there. And so take advantage of this last moment to let the truth of what God is saying really soak in. So Lord, we just take this message to you.